The problem with Vice President Gore and other global warming extremists is that they distort the science, grossly exaggerate the risks, argue that anyone who disagrees with them is corrupt, and suggest that solutions are easy and cheap. And that's an all too convenient fiction. Perhaps Gore's most disturbing claim is that climate change is not a political issue, but a moral issue. Yet what he wants to do involves large political interventions in the economy and a vast expansion of government power. He says he wants to use markets, but what he really means is that he wants to pass laws making energy much more expensive. That is a truth so inconvenient to Gore's agenda that he conceals it in his movie. One of the defects, I think, of Vice President Gore's approach to this issue is that he begins from a standpoint of philosophical pessimism that sees man as deeply separated from nature by technology. And that's why he calls for things like a wrenching transformation of society to solve the problem of climate change. This seems to me to be very doubtful and maybe even dangerous because it suggests that we can solve some very deep human problems through politics. We've never been able to do that, and I don't think it's compatible with democracy. Climate change really boils down to three issues. One is, what's happening right now? The second issue is, what's likely to happen in the future? And the third issue is, what are the reasonable policy prescriptions we might consider adopting to deal with the uncertain risk of climate change? And that's what I'm trying to talk about uh, in this film and in the work I do, uh, both for the Pacific Research Institute and the American Enterprise Institute. We need to step back a moment, catch our breath, and consider a few things Gore and other extremists leave out of their account of the end of the world. Thank you all for coming out today to talk about this uh, difficult and contentious subject of climate change. Um, as everyone knows and has heard, uh, former Vice President Gore has a now famous PowerPoint show about climate change made into a hit movie, and I thought since he has one, I should have one too. <laughs> It's not really my purpose to debate Vice President Gore or anybody else point by point. Much of what Vice President Gore says about climate change is correct. The planet is warming. Human beings are playing a substantial role in that warming. How large that warming is going to be and how we ought to respond to it is still an open question. Uh, but beyond that, which might be described as the general consensus, uh, the Vice President and a lot of other people make some extreme claims about what is likely to happen in the future that are not backed up by the science. Uh, and beyond that, they're saying also that the debate should now be closed, that the science is settled, that there are no important questions left open, uh, and that there is a firm consensus that we are headed toward inevitable catastrophe. It is claimed that uh, human civilization itself is at risk, that billions of people might die. Now, if you pay close attention to the people saying this, you will notice that with one or two notable exceptions, such as NASA's chief climate scientist, James Hansen, most of the people who make these extreme claims are not scientists, but politicians, headline-seeking journalists, environmental advocates, and uh, windy Anglican bishops who can't understand why people aren't coming to church anymore on Sunday. So the subject has become so politicized that it's almost impossible to have a rational and calm conversation about climate. Either you are an alarmist or you are a skeptic, and both terms have acquired a lot of uh, pejorative baggage. It's considered an act of bad faith to mention uncertainty in the science, even though nearly every scientific article you will read uh, mentions uncertainty in what we know about the subject. And finally, some really extraordinary things are being said about anyone who dares to dissent from the view that catastrophe is upon us. Uh, people like me are sometimes now called climate change deniers, with the none too subtle suggestion that we are the moral equivalent of Holocaust deniers. Not long ago, an environmental writer wrote on a prominent environmental website that someday, 10 or 20 years from now, we should have Nuremberg trials for climate skeptics. <laughs> Now, the fellow hastily retracted that uh, a statement, partly after I sent him an email, since I know him slightly, saying, Dave, have you lost your mind? 
Uh, but who can doubt that that really captures the uh, ferocity of some of the views of the climate um, uh, alarmists? And so, for example, not long ago, last week, in fact, a columnist for the Guardian newspaper in England wrote the following. Every time someone dies as a result of floods in Bangladesh, an airline executive should be dragged out of his office and drowned. Now, I'm starting to rethink my skepticism about hate uh, speech legislation after reading something like that. Or even NASA's James Hansen wrote this recently in the New York Review of Books. Quote, a certain shock treatment is needed, but it would best be delivered with a two by four as a solid whack to the head of politicians who remain oblivious to fundamental physical facts, close quote. Well, now, Dr. Hansen's a nice fellow. I've debated him a couple of times, and I'm certain he means that as a metaphorical statement. Uh, but on the other hand, is it so unthinkable that some extremists might someday act on statements like that? I mean, it strikes me that the weather underground from the 1960s might make a comeback, and they wouldn't even need to change their name. <laughs> well, what's also said about people who don't agree with the party line on catastrophe is that we're spreading disinformation and confusion, uh, that the, somehow the public's not getting the message. And I find this kind of bizarre, given the lavish media coverage. Time Magazine does a regular issue on climate catastrophe every few months, it seems. And sometimes I think maybe uh, we should be flattered. I mean, is it really plausible that a tiny handful of skeptical individuals are managing to um, outweigh environmental activist groups with multi-million dollar budgets, not to mention national governments committed to this issue? It seems a little implausible when you think about uh, the amount of publicity that goes on. Here's two more from Time Magazine, if you just keep going back. A Vanity Fair's green issue printed, I note, on non-recyclable paper. Uh, and Wired Magazine talks about the climate crisis. One of the things we now see a lot in the media coverage is that we're reaching a climate tipping point. You know, if Malcolm Gladwell had a nickel for every time people use the phrase tipping point, well, I think he's actually sold a, a, you know, a book every time someone says tipping point. But I wanted to do a, sort of a little um, calculation on uh, how much the tipping point language is being used. And so I did uh, a cliche alert uh, test on Nexus, searching for the uh, terms climate change and tipping point and you can see we've gone from under 200 in 2001 up to about 1300 through November of 2006. Why am I interested in this subject in the first place? Well, I've been researching and writing about the environment for almost 20 years, and I like to say that the environment is much too important to be left to environmentalists. I grew up in the suburbs of Los Angeles in the 1960s when the smog was so bad I couldn't breathe most summer afternoons. I couldn't go outside and play, and if I did try to go outside and play, I'd usually have to go inside and lie down for the rest of the afternoon. And one of the things that interested me later on in graduate school in Southern California was how much the smog was starting to diminish. In fact, what's happened in Los Angeles in the last generation is that the population has doubled, the number of cars on the road has tripled, and smog levels have fallen by more than 75%. You can actually see the mountains now, which you couldn't do when I was a child growing up. Well, that's a good example of how we can actually make progress on the environment, even as our economy and population continue to grow. In the early 1990s, I started studying environmental trend data more closely, because one of the things that is interesting and upsetting about environmental issues is that most Americans think that the environment in the United States is getting worse. That's what they tell pollsters by a huge margin. And in fact, what our data show is that in most areas, not all areas, but most areas, environmental quality in the U.S. is improving rapidly and dramatically. So that's why I started uh, doing the annual report, the Index of Leading Environmental Indicators for the Pacific Research Institute, was to try and tell that story uh, try and explore where we are making progress in the environment and most importantly why we're making progress on the environment. That way we can apply the lessons of success to areas where we're not making as rapid a progress. How do we know that climate change is happening? An awful lot of this issue seems to go forward in the public mind through signs and wonders. Uh, so, for example, we hear a lot about hurricanes these days. Uh, we see uh, videos of, ice, uh, of uh, you know, the ice cap shrinking in Antarctica or of icebergs breaking off the Ross ice shelf in Antarctica. Uh, one of my favorite signs and wonders is this one. Um, <laughs> this one goes around the Internet a lot. 
but I, you know, I mean, uh, this isn't so far off what you sometimes hear. One of my favorite indicators is what I call the armadillo indicator. Uh, Dr. Hansen, and I'm sorry to keep picking on him, but he's so prominent in this issue. In his recent speeches, he's been citing a letter he got from a farmer in Arkansas saying, every year I notice armadillos moving, moving further north because the climate is changing. Well, the real evidence comes from uh, this data series of the temperature of the Earth. And what it shows is the temperature record for about the last 150 years and a net increase of about 0.6 degrees Celsius. And if you look closely, one of the things you notice is we had a leg up between about 1910 and 1940. And then it's flat for 40 years, between 1940 and 1980, or even slightly down. And then another leg up in the last 20 years or so. Now, there was some controversy for a while about the reliability of this temperature record. Uh, but uh, most of those uh, doubts have been smoothed out, most of the uncertainties eliminated. And this is pretty well accepted to be the temperature record um, that uh, we have experienced in the last 150 years. So a number of questions occur to you right away. Um, first of all, is this extraordinary? We'll talk about that in a minute. Also, is it uniform? And this is an important point. Turns out that while this is the average temperature of the globe going up, it's not happening uniformly everywhere in the world. In fact, it tends to be concentrated in the polar regions. Uh, this is a, Napa, a, a NASA false color image, they call it, uh, of the globe back in the winter of 2001. And not surprisingly, the red areas are areas that are warmer. Uh, the lighter colored areas are areas that have uh, less change from the long-term record. And you can see that the warming is concentrated, especially in the alpine regions and then the Antarctic Peninsula down at the bottom there, which we will talk about in a moment. Uh, NASA will also give you this image, uh, which is 30 years worth of temperature anomalies in the Arctic region concentrated over Alaska and Western Canada and Siberia. It's this phenomenon especially that yields these very dramatic images that Vice President Gore and others use of glaciers retreating. Uh, here's the Muir Glacier in 1941 in Alaska and the same spot in the year 2000. Now what this means in the grand scheme of things, I mean these are very dramatic pictures and are very captivating of your imagination. Um, but what they mean in the grand scheme of things is less clear for some reasons we'll get into. For a very long time it was thought that this was the climate history of the planet for the last thousand years. This chart was taken from the 1990 report of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And if you don't follow the subject, the IPCC is the official international body set up to assess the science on climate change and advise world leaders on what might or should be done about it. And so it was thought we had a medieval warm period about 1,000 years ago. And maybe some of you have heard some of the stories of Vikings going to Greenland, planting wheat, grazing cattle. There's some uh, accounts in Chinese folklore of Chinese sailors sailing in an ice-free Arctic Ocean. Can't really know if those stories are reliable since we don't have maps from those, uh, uh, from those ages. But the point is, is that if the medieval warm period, and then followed by the Little Ice Age and the sort of late Renaissance period, was correct, it would mean that uh, it was possible that the warming we're experiencing right now is not extraordinary. And by the way, how did the medieval warm period happen? I mean, there weren't too many SUVs on the road a thousand years ago. So there must be some natural reasons for climate variation. Well, this was the accepted wisdom for quite a while, a good 15 or 20 years. And then about 10 years ago, along came this finding. This is the famous hockey stick chart. Um, and what you notice here is a very sharp rise in temperature in recent years. This is 1,000 years on the scale from roughly the year 1,000 to 2,000. The medieval warm period disappears. The little ice age disappears. And suddenly it was claimed that we were now the warmest we had been by quite a lot in the last 1,000 years. Now there was a problem. A lot of people who look closely at the methodology uh, and the, uh, the temperature proxies, that is the ways we estimated temperatures six, seven, eight hundred years ago from things like ice core samples, bristle cone pine trees, that's an interesting one to think about. Uh, there were criticisms of both the proxies that were used uh, and the statistical methods used to produce this chart. And the controversy got so intense that the National Academy of Sciences appointed an uh, expert panel to review uh, the hockey stick uh, and to see what they made of it, if they could confirm its findings or say there's some problems here. Now, the report came out a few months ago, and most of the media reports said hockey stick confirmed, or headlines to that effect. Of course, if you read the whole report more closely, uh, it was hedged in the usual way scientists often do this. What they said was 
This temperature reconstruction is plausible. However, they went on to say, uh, we really can have no confidence in our temperature reconstruction beyond about 400 years back. We simply don't have enough data, enough proxies to go on. And they added a number of the statistical techniques that were criticized look shaky to them. So in fact, they validated a number of the criticisms that were made. One of the members of the panel uh, was Kurt Cuffey from the University of California at Berkeley. And he said this to Science Magazine about the hockey stick chart. The IPCC used it as a visual prominently in the 2001 report. I should pause for a moment and say that to mix metaphors, the hockey stick was thought to be the smoking gun of human-caused climate change. And so it was used very prominently in that 2001 report. So to continue with Cuffey, I think that sent a very misleading message about how resolved this part of the scientific research was. Close quote. That doesn't sound to me like settled science, that there's no debate or uncertainty or further investigation to be had. Um, more recently, reconstructions of the same data using different statistical techniques gets this set of curves for the last 1,000 years temperature history. And what you see is the medieval warm period reappearing along with the um, little ice age reappearing. Or if you want to look at just some recent articles in Science Magazine in the last year, uh, there up on the top, medieval warm period back in the scientific literature. Or down here underlined is medieval warm period and little ice age. Uh, that doesn't sound like a settled science or consensus to me about the hockey stick. And sure enough, the hockey stick is unlikely to appear in the next report of the IPCC that's due out about 12 months from now. Now, this is about the past. What about the future? An awful lot of what we're talking about is trying to guess by some means what the temperature is going to be 50 or 100 years from now and what effects that will have. And so we're doing this with models computer models, very fancy and sophisticated computer models. And just to give an example of how hard this must be, just from a common sense point of view, watch this NASA animation of a, 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 a month in the life of planet Earth. And our climate models have to figure out not only the effect of greenhouse gases, but the motion and effect of clouds and the different kinds of clouds, the feedback effects of the oceans, um, what happens to uh, plant and animal life, uh, growth of vegetation, hundreds and thousands of potential feedback loops, you might say, which makes climate modeling one of the most complicated modeling exercises ever done, I think, by computers. Even though our computers get fancier and better all the time, the climate models often take days or weeks to run on the largest supercomputers uh, in the world. There are some simpler aspects to it. I mean, you can really get off in the weeds of climate models, but the basic um, aspect of this controversy to think on for a moment is trends in especially carbon dioxide, the main greenhouse gas. And what's been going on, and Vice President Gore shows this and explains it quite well in his movie, is that the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been rising at about one half of one percent per year um, for about a century. And that's what's shown in the top line that chops up and down. It chops up and down because every year when spring happens in the northern hemisphere, all the trees and plants that leaf out absorb a, a large amount of carbon dioxide. But the overall level is gradually edging up. And it's now about 100 parts per million higher than the estimated level um, in pre-industrial times. Well, what does this all mean? Well, the IPCC's official temperature forecasts are that 100 years from now, Global temperatures on average would be in the range of 1.6 degrees Celsius higher to as high as 5.8 degrees Celsius higher than they are today. That's a pretty broad range. I should mention, by the way, that advanced copies of the next IPCC report that are circulating in draft suggest they're going to lower their top end forecast down to about 4.5 degrees Celsius and that they're also going to reduce their estimate of the human impact on climate change by, the early report is, 25%. Interesting little tidbit emerging in the science right now. This chart explains why we get the range between 1.6 degrees on the low end and 5.8 degrees on the high end. It depends entirely on the emissions forecasts for greenhouse gases for the next century. If we keep going at more or less the present rate of greenhouse gases increasing in the atmosphere by about one half of 1% a year, you get the low end, uh, the red line on that chart. And it gives you a fairly low temperature increase forecast. 
The high temperature forecast comes from the assumption that greenhouse gas emissions are going to soar more than double uh, um, the amount that uh, accumulates in the atmosphere. And that is based on assumptions of very, very high rates of economic growth. For example, one of the scenarios they use uses suggests that North Korea will catch up to the United States in per capita income by the year 2100. I mean, not just our per capita income now, but our per capita income in the year 2100. That's how much faster than the US the IPCC thinks that the economy will grow. Uh, a lot of people have noticed that these scenarios are not credible and realistic, and is one reason probably why their forecasts of temperature rise are going to come down in the next report. It also assumes very low rates of technological substitution. I mean, on the surface, you might say, well, look, we hear about India and China. China is going to pass the United States in three years as the world's leading emitter of greenhouse gases. But it's worth thinking about the fact that when China does that in three years, they will still have an economy less than a third as large as the United States, which means, ex which means what? It means their economy is extraordinarily energy inefficient and that there are large gains to be had in their greenhouse gas emissions profile as well, as well as their economy from acquiring some basic energy efficiencies. And that's something they're really after in a pretty serious way. That's another way of saying that these projections of very high rates of greenhouse gas emissions growth are unrealistic and unduly pessimistic, which is another way of saying that the overwhelming likelihood, if the models are right about the effect of greenhouse gases on temperature, is that we're looking at a modest increase um, in uh, global temperatures over the next century. Well, climate change is arguably the most complicated scientific issue humanity has ever investigated. And it requires the coordination of multiple disciplines in a way that has never been done before. And that's one of the things that makes all the more outrageous the idea that the science is settled, that there are no important uncertainties worth discussing, or that there can be no doubt about the policies we might uh, try to address the problem. I try to simplify the scientific issues for APINS without compromising the complexity of the subject. The problem with uh, the Vice President Gore's uh, book and movie could be compared to the Da Vinci Code. It begins with some well-known and well-accepted facts and then goes off to make extreme, exaggerated, and fanciful claims that are not well-founded in science. Well, one of the things that he says is that at the current CO2 levels, we will pass the threshold beyond dangerous consequences within 20 years. Does your science say something other than that? Oh, absolutely. Look, there's lots of reasons to doubt that the models uh, remember, we're trying to predict the future with computer models. We have a pretty bad track record at that. We're trying to model one of the most complicated phenomena science has ever studied, and there's lots of confounding literature that appears in the scientific journals almost every week that casts that kind of statement into serious doubt. Now, what I want to do is spend a little bit of time going through this schematic from the IPCC's last report. It never appears in any of the Time Magazine articles on climate change or any other of the popular press accounts that you see. This is IPCC's account of what they call climate forcings. Forcing is a technical term for things that make temperature go up or that make it go down. The items that go up from the center line are positive forcings, or thing that, things that make the temperature go up. The things that are below the center line are negative forcings, or things that cool the Earth's temperature. Another thing to note about how this uh, chart is organized is the solid bars are effects that they're quite confident uh, in their estimate and magnitude. The thin lines are the possible estimates of the effect, but represent the range of uncertainty. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. So you see all the way over on the left um, is uh, greenhouse gases. There you have a considerable amount of positive forcing effect, meaning uh, an effect warming the planet. And then you get over to this whole group here on the right side of the chart that's aerosols and clouds. And there you see things going in both directions. There's one there, mineral dust, that they're not even sure if it's a positive or negative forcing. And then the thing I really want you to pay attention to is this axis along the bottom. That's called level of scientific understanding. And they've rated all of along there, um, high, medium, medium, and then all the rest are low, very low, very low, very low, very low, very low, very low, and very low. Does this sound like scientific certainty to you when the official climate science body puts out a report like this? This same chart is going to appear in our next report a year from now. And they're going to upgrade a couple of these from very low to low. Uh, 
So there's been some project, progress, but not a lot. Now, I want to direct your attention to one in particular here, and it's the one all the way over here on the right that I'm circling that says solar. There's been a lot of thought for a while that climate change or recent climate change is the result of variations in uh, the sun's uh, sunspot activity or its uh, luminosity and other aspects of solar cycles. Now, what you see here is it is a positive forcing, uh, but a fairly modest one. And there are a number of scientists who say it, it should be larger than that. Um, but this is what could be described as a consensus, that it's fairly low. Now, there's, I'll just show you three articles from the scientific literature from this year. And you see why you can get whiplash following this issue. Here's one by several uh, prominent climate scientists, including the fourth one on the list, Tom Widgley, that says, we don't think that uh, variations in, in the sun have uh, had any effect or very little effect on um, global temperatures in, since the 17th century. They do add, though, this at the end of their article. Additional climate forcing by changes in the sun's output cannot be ruled out. The suggested mechanisms, however, are too complex to evaluate meaningfully at present, which may be a fancy way of saying, well, you know, we really just don't know very well. Meanwhile, in geophysical research letters, uh, two physicists from Duke University estimated that the sun, the last line on the chart here, the sun might have contributed approximately 50% of the observed global warming since 1900. So there's one group saying none or close to none. Here's another group saying 50%. And finally, an article from last May in Environmental Geology uh, where two geologists who studied uh, changes in the Earth's orbit as well as um, uh, changes in solar radiation say that they think that these changes are four to five orders of magnitude greater than human impacts on the Earth's climate. So there, you saw one group of scientists saying very little or none at all, another group saying half, another group saying the human uh, uh, component of this is very small compared to the sun. Well, that doesn't sound like consensus or settled science to me either. Now, the mystery deepens, uh, and here next where I'm going to want the ladder to be brought up. The mystery deepens when we, when we ponder this chart. This is a data series that Vice President Gore also uses in his movie. What it is is 450,000 years of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere on the top, methane concentrations in the middle, and global temperatures on the bottom. Now, if you saw the Vice President's movie, you'll remember that he gets on a cherry picker. And you know, he punches the button and very dramatically raises himself up to point at the top of the chart. I'm going to save energy and use a ladder. He goes way up high here and he points at these lines and saying, my goodness, look what's happening to the human emissions of carbon dioxide and methane. The point being they're way out of the range of what we observe historically. I will just add one little observation here. Methane concentrations in the atmosphere seem to have flattened. And in the last year, there have been a lot of very surprising findings about methane, such as a great deal more methane gets into the atmosphere from natural sources, including a story this week that the media loved about uh, cows and livestock, uh, maybe even more than industrial sources of methane. Uh, so what that means is that it's not entirely clear that human beings are responsible for more than half of this rise. But the real point of this is that by getting up on a cherry picker and pointing at these uh, trends way up here, the vice president and others who use this chart are engaged in a very interesting case of misdirection. Because one of the things they don't tell you, remember it's 450,000 years of time we're seeing here. And these lines are not overlaid. But if they were and the time scale were expanded, you'd notice something quite anomalous about this. And that is that in almost every case, the temperature rise precedes the rise in greenhouse gases. In other words, the cause and effect is reversed. And beyond that, there is the question of why did we get those temperature spikes with almost metronomic regularity, by the way, in the first place? I mean, after all, there were no SUVs 350,000 years ago either. So what caused this? Well, we're back to the solar radiation hypothesis, I think, and changes in the Earth orbit and so forth. There's another item on this chart that's important to understand. And it's this one right here called the aerosol indirect effect. This has to do partly with clouds and the brightness of clouds. Partly it has to do with you know, particulates, haze, dust, all kinds of things that get in the atmosphere that are reflective of radiation, some of them caused by humans, 
Some of them caused by forest fires or just dust blowing off the ground. But what we're talking about is things like the you know, cloud of haze you can see over the Atlantic Ocean in this satellite photo. There's a growing literature about uh, the negative aerosol forcing. Uh, Science Magazine in 2003 saying we really don't have much of a handle on this subject. Uh, then more recently in Science Magazine, a group of scientists concluded that uh, we think that aerosols in the atmosphere uh, increase global cloud cover and correspond to a forcing that is larger than and of, and of opposite sign to that of greenhouse gases. In other words, aerosols in the atmosphere might cancel out almost entirely the forcings we see from greenhouse gases. Or if the uh, scientific community moves towards that consensus, what you're going to see is that you're going to get a bar of certainty that looks something like that in future climate modeling exercises. And that's going to leave us with a considerable mystery, because what you see is the positive and negative forcings coming close to canceling each other out, but we have seen these rising temperatures of the last century. This doesn't sound like consensus and settled science to me. One last thing on this issue about clouds. Uh, clouds, water vapor, turn out to be the most important variable in the greenhouse effect. Now, clouds are evanescent. You know, they come and go within hours or days. Uh, but there's constant churning of clouds in the atmosphere. The climate models are very poor at understanding cloud behavior. Here's a chart from Richard Lindzen at MIT. The solid line in the middle are the actual observations of cloud cover from 90 degrees north latitude to 90 degrees south. And then the thin lines are the predictions for cloud cover by different climate model runs. And you can see there's a little correspondence around uh, the zero latitude, the equator, uh, but not very good uh, out toward the extremes. And there's other uh, reviews of uh, climate models and cloud performance that do the same thing uh, and that do no better uh, than this particular run. Now let's change subjects a little bit. I mentioned about uh, making extreme claims about what's happening. And so Vice President Gore and here Vanity Fair magazine talk about the possibility of 20 or 30 foot sea level rise, you know, burying uh, Manhattan. Now, of course, New York haters say, what's the downside here? <laughs> um, now, this is what you hear a lot. What does the IPCC actually say about sea level rise? Well, here's their rather complicated chart. This also refers to those temperature forecasts I showed you earlier from 1.6 degrees on the low end to 5.8 degrees on the high end. And this is their predictions for global sea level rise. At the extreme, the highest estimate, they say we'd get 0.88 meters, less than three feet at the highest end of their temperature prediction. By the way, the early drafts circulating say that the IPCC is likely to cut their maximum sea level rise projection in half in their next report. The next one will have about 0.4 meters. And then you remember that video I showed earlier that Vice President Gore likes to show of a piece of ice the size of Rhode Island breaking off the Ross Ice Shelf. It's from the, this little peninsula up in Antarctica. And you know it sounds very dramatic to say a piece of ice the size of an American state. It would be less dramatic if you said a piece of ice the size of Orange County, California, which is roughly the same size as Rhode Island. And it's even less dramatic still if you back up and notice the small part of the entire Antarctic ice mass that we're talking about. What's actually going on in Antarctica, from a recent article in Science uh, a year ago actually, is that while the minus signs show the ice that is declining down on, uh, on the uh, western side of Antarctica, plus signs show the ice masses that are growing in East Antarctica. Now, Again, you can get whiplash trying to follow the science on this. I'll show you three articles, uh, all published in um, the last year or so. First one says, snowfall-driven growth in East Antarctica mitigates recent sea level rise. That study concluded that actually it's, it's lowering our sea level a little bit. Middle study says, uh, we can't really see any change in snowfall in Antarctica. And the bottom one says, uh, from a, a review of satellite data, increasing mass loss in Antarctica. You can be forgiven for getting dizzy trying to follow the uh, um, clashing science on this. Now, it's possible if you read these articles closely that they don't contradict each other as much or as directly as the headlines suggest. They're often looking at different data sets, different time periods, that's quite important, um, and different parts of the ice mass. This also becomes true in the case of Greenland. Uh, two articles uh, from just a few months apart in Science Magazine, one saying satellite confirms accelerated melting of the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, 
another study uh, saying the ice sheet on the interior is growing. And then finally, another study out from a German and British researcher saying um, we can't see uh, any serious amount of sea level rise from projected, projected melting of ice sheets or glaciers in the next century. Uh, this one did get a little bit of press. So a group of Japanese scientists uh, collated a lot of the different studies, tried to harmonize them, and what they concluded is Antarctic sea ice is going down. If you remember that uh, false color image from earlier, there's quite a bit more warming happening there than anywhere. But Antarctic sea ice is going up. One thing that Vice President Gore does very well in his movie is explain that Arctic sea ice, because it's ice that's already in the ocean, if it melts, it doesn't actually raise the sea level because it's already in the water. And he shows you know, ice cubes in a glass in an animation in his movie that's actually quite, uh, quite effective. The other one that comes up a lot that the Vice President uses is Mount Kilimanjaro in Kenya. Uh, we're told that, uh, and this is probably true, that within another few decades, uh, the mountain will be ice-free. And this is taken as a sign of global warming. Well, a lot of the scientists who look at this say, not so fast. This article from the International Journal of Climatology, as you can see, says, this is an overly simplistic view. And as they reviewed the data available on Mount Kilimanjaro, they found something interesting. Uh, here's a chart that's from this article that shows ice masses on Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Kenya and another um, um, snow-capped peak in East Africa. Mount Kilimanjaro is this middle time set here, and you see that you begin losing ice mass from the mountain way back in 1880, long before a rise in greenhouse gases or change in temperatures. What this study concluded is that the loss of ice on Mount Kilimanjaro is much more correlated to changes in land use in the area, cutting down some of the forests, which had effects on some of the moisture convection around the mountain and made it drier on the top of the mountain. Well, enough of this. We can go on a long time about some of these, uh, you know, the, the confusing science and the contradictory science on ice masses, sea level rise. Uh, what most people want to know is, as well, to the extent that there's a risk of climate change uh, with significant damages at some point in the future, what ought we to do about the matter? Well, our first shot out of the box was the Kyoto Protocol. Um, Kyoto, I think almost everyone agrees, even John Kerry in the last election campaign, is a dead letter. I'm quite convinced in the fullness of time, we're going to come to regard the Kyoto Protocol as the climate policy equivalent of wage and price controls in the 1970s. This chart's from the latest report of the European Environment Agency on how the European nations are doing complying with their Kyoto targets. Their target is down here. That's what they're supposed to get by 2012 or so. They're on a path to end up up there. And remember that Kyoto was supposed to be step one. And if step one is proving so difficult to do, what is step two going to be? And remember also that even if fully implemented by everybody, including the United States, uh, the Kyoto Protocol would have done virtually nothing to lower temperature rise over the next century, even according to the climate scientists' own models. Well, lately there's been a lot of talk about what's known as stabilization wedges. Uh, I'll explain this idea. It comes from uh, two economists at Princeton University, um, Robert Sokolow and Stephen Pakala. And what they say is, is, look, the Kyoto business got us off on the wrong foot. And you know, it looked like a mountain too high to climb to reduce emissions from 1990 by the year 2010 or so. What we think is, is we ought to think about what future emissions might be on the globe. They think they're going to double the next 50 years from 7 gigatons to 14 gigatons. And instead of just having a sort of a global carbon budget, let's divide the thing up like a pie and think of seven wedges, each one of which, if they were implemented, would lower our emissions or keep them constant uh, to about where they are today. And they include things like uh, higher building efficiency standards and energy efficiency. Uh, one that interests me is um, doubling the fuel economy of the entire world's auto fleet and limiting people's driving to no more than 10,000 miles a year, or maybe even as little as 5,000 miles a year. Well, I'm not sure how realistic that is. Um, I'm not even sure environmentalists would like this idea. Um, I took this film a couple years ago of a League of Conservation Voters bumper sticker, I Vote to Protect the Environment, on the back of a Ford Explorer V8. It turns out even environmentalists might not go for this idea. But never mind that. I, I, you, know, you can divide any problem into wedges, you know, world hunger, uh, children poverty. Um, and simple to conceptually solve any problem that way. 
especially if you don't attach cost estimates to it uh, and weigh certain trade-offs. But nonetheless, I think this idea of the stabilization wedges is a more promising approach to thinking about the problem. Now, here's the curious thing. Vice President Gore mentioned the stabilization wedges as the only real policy idea in his movie. But when it showed up in his movie, there were only six stabilization wedges. One of them went missing. This is actually from Scientific American, which did the same thing. Well, what do you suppose went missing? This is from Sokolo and Pakala. And this has all seven of their wedges. And one of their wedges is nuclear power. And Vice President Gore just skipped over that one and left it out entirely uh, in his movie. Now, this seems to me a case of environmental correctness right out of the 1970s. And it's, I think it's very hard to take people seriously who say that we're facing the worst crisis in the history of the planet, but, ref, but rule out one proven existing technology that's nearly carbon free. There are other things that uh, you hear a lot about. One that Vice President Gore mentioned uh, is carbon sequestration. And, and here's a diagram actually I think from the, uh, one of the Canadian energy bureaus. Which shows that what we're doing is we're going to figure out ways to get carbon out of uh, especially coal-fired power plants and stored underground in various other ways. Uh, Vice President Gore in his movie says, you're going to hear a lot more about this. The interesting thing is a lot of environmentalists are not very enthusiastic about this idea uh, because they think it would be letting us off the hook uh, from our evil ways of using fossil fuels. There's a monomania about we've got to wring fossil fuels out of our system. And if you think it's bad when you talk about sequestration, it really gets ferocious when you mention the idea of geoengineering. You remember a few minutes ago talking about particulates in the atmosphere, uh, you know, and aerosols and how that might have a cooling effect. Well, here's Tom Widgley, again, one of the leading climate scientists uh, who's generally thought of as a believer in the more extreme scenarios of climate change, who says we ought to think about whether we can manipulate the aerosol content of the atmosphere to, um, to mitigate any potential uh, temperature rise. Well, this idea sets off a firestorm when it's brought up. Uh, one climate economist says that would be like giving methadone to a heroin addict. Using fossil fuels is now considered the moral equivalent of a drug addiction. Uh, even uh, Rolling Stone magazine gets in on the act in its current issue, Can Dr. Evil Save the World? With a fairly even-handed article saying, this sounds kind of wacky to us, but maybe we should take this idea more seriously. Well, two concluding thoughts. One is, is uh, again, I mentioned earlier the demonization of people who dare to question the catastrophe consensus. In fact, there is confounding science published almost every week in the professional literature. I don't necessarily say contradictory, but confounding, meaning it confounds our grasp of the issue. And then finally, I'll leave you with this shot of the Earth and share with you the comments of one of um, the leading climate researchers in Britain. It's Mike Hume, who is the director of the Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research. They're one of the leading climate modeling outfits in Britain. And, you know, a lot of scientists are quite intimidated these days to dissent from the party line. But last week, uh, Mr. Hume said this to the BBC News. Climate change is a reality, and science confirms that human activities are heavily implicated in this change. But over the last few years, a new environmental phenomenon has been constructed in this country, the phenomenon of catastrophic climate change. It seems that mere climate change was not going to be bad enough, and so it must now be catastrophic to be worthy of attention. The increasing use of this pejorative term and its bedfellow qualifiers, chaotic, irreversible, rapid, has altered the public discourse around climate change. I have found myself increasingly chastised by climate change campaigners when my public statements and lectures on climate change have not satisfied their thirst for environmental drama and exaggerated rhetoric. It seems that it is we, the professional climate scientists, who are now the catastrophe skeptics how the wheel turns. Why is it not just campaigners, but politicians and scientists too, who are openly confusing the language of fear, terror, and disaster with the observable physical reality of climate change, actively ignoring the careful hedging which surrounds science's predictions? To state that climate change will be catastrophic hides a cascade of value-laden assumptions
which do not emerge from empirical or theoretical science. Well, I'll conclude with this thought. The catastrophic climate change emperor, unlike the emperor in the, in the famous fable, may not be entirely naked, but he's not wearing very much. The point is, at every step, the greenhouse gas campaigners make the most pessimistic assumptions and forecasts, extrapolate any changes occurring in nature into harbingers of catastrophe, and they pound the table for an expansion of government control of resources. We are going to find that the problem of climate change is like other environmental challenges of the past generation, greatly exaggerated by the activists and more susceptible to improvement than we think. The problem of climate change is going to look very different in the next generation.